I'm not ashamed. What did Israel vow to do before God and Joshua at Shechem? This is the question that we seek to answer today as we continue our verse by verse study of the book of Joshua on Walking Through the Bible. Today we're going to be discussing Joshua 24, verses 14 to 28. But before we do that, let's read the passage. If you have a Bible with you, you can turn to Joshua 24, verse 14. But if you don't have a Bible, don't worry. Just follow along with us on the screen. The version that we'll be reading from is the New King James Version. So Joshua 24, beginning at verse 14. Now therefore fear the Lord, serve him in sincerity and in truth, and put away the gods which your fathers served on the other side of the river and in Egypt. Serve the Lord. And if it seems evil to you to serve the Lord, choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve, whether the gods which your fathers served that were on the other side of the river, or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. So the people answered and said, Far be it from us that we should forsake the Lord to serve other gods. The Lord our God is he who brought us and our fathers out of the land of Egypt from the house of bondage, who did those great signs in our sight and preserved us in all the way that we went among all the people through whom we passed. And the Lord drove out from before us all the people, including the Amorites who dwelt in the land. We also will serve the Lord, for he is our God. But Joshua said to the people, You cannot serve the Lord, for he is a holy God. He is a jealous God. He will not forgive your transgressions nor your sins. If you forsake the Lord and serve foreign idols, then he will turn and do you harm and consume you after he has done you good. And the people said to Joshua, No, but we will serve the Lord. So Joshua said to the people, You are witnesses against yourselves that you have chosen the Lord for yourself to serve him. And they said, We are witnesses. Now therefore, he said, Put away the foreign gods which are among you, and incline your heart to the Lord God of Israel. And the people said to Joshua, The Lord our God we will serve, and his voice we will obey. So Joshua made a covenant with the people that day, and made for them a statute and an ordinance in Shechem. Then Joshua wrote these words in the book of the law of God, and he took a large stone and set it up under the oak, that was by the sanctuary of the Lord. And Joshua said to all the people, Behold, this stone shall be a witness to us, for it has heard all the words of the Lord which he spoke to us. It shall therefore be a witness to you, lest you deny your God. So Joshua let the people depart, each to his own inheritance. Israel is at Shechem, called there by Joshua before he died, in order to renew the covenant they made with Jehovah. Joshua gave Israel the reason that they should serve Jehovah, because he is the God who keeps promises, the only God able to do so. The gods that Abraham served before being called by God couldn't do that, for they were false gods created by man. And neither could the gods of any other nation that surrounded Israel at that time, for they too were false gods created by man. The only reason that Israel was there in Canaan right then was because Jehovah God kept his promise to Abraham and gave them that land. Knowing this, Israel was now going to be faced with a choice to serve God in sincerity and truth and put away false gods, or to go after those false gods, which had accomplished nothing for them, nor could they ever. Joshua isn't giving Israel a true choice between good and evil here, as if either choice is acceptable. He's doing what Moses did back in Deuteronomy 30, telling them that the only way forward is to choose to serve God, for if they didn't, only punishment would come. Whatever they chose, though, wouldn't affect Joshua's choice, for he and his family would serve the Lord. How could Joshua be so confident in his family that lived then? Because he had raised his family in the ways of the Lord. The duty of a father is to raise his children to serve God through teaching and example. Joshua, though not a perfect man, did have faith in God as exhibited by what he did. His children saw that faith and developed faith of their own in God. But Joshua served. Such a blessing to Joshua to know that his family was faithful to God that could bring eternal life. At that time, though, Israel vowed and declared they would do the same, that they would put away idolatry, for how could they forsake the Lord that had done these things for them? And even though later generations would fall away, I believe Israel told the truth here, for they had seen what God had done for them. 
Unfortunately, their children didn't develop their own faith, either because their parents didn't teach them, or they chose to reject the teachings of their parents. Whatever the case, we know that later Israel did go after other gods and suffer the consequences for that choice. When Joshua says in verse 19 that Israel could not serve the Lord, for he is a holy God, we can easily become confused, thinking that Joshua was saying that it was impossible for Israel to serve God. If that was true, how then could Joshua be so confident that his family could along with him? Were they somehow better than Israel as a whole? But if you don't stop at verse 19, but continue to verse 20, you find out that Joshua wasn't saying that it was impossible altogether to serve a holy God, but impossible if they went after other gods. Why would that be impossible? Because God wouldn't forgive Israel of their sins if they did this, and God would send them punishment for this choice. This is similar to what Jesus said in Matthew 6.24 when he said a person couldn't serve God and mammon. People can't serve Jehovah and false gods at the same time, for Jehovah won't accept such worship. This should be a lesson for us today as it concerns our worship. Now Israel proclaimed again that they would give up idolatry and serve only God. Joshua then proclaimed that they are witness to this fact, to which Israel agreed, thus renewing the covenant at Shechem that they made with God at Sinai. As a record of that covenant, Joshua wrote these words and others in the book of the law of God. We would call the better part of this the book of Joshua. He also took a large stone and set it up in Shechem under the oak that was by the sanctuary of the Lord. Now this phrase, sanctuary of the Lord, should not be taken to mean the tabernacle, which was at Shiloh, but simply a holy place where this ceremony took place which would be near where Abraham and Jacob worshipped God many centuries earlier. Joshua told Israel the meaning of this stone, which was to be a witness to them of their promise to serve God, lest they later deny God. After the ceremony, Joshua let the people depart each to their own inheritance. And so with these verses, we come to the end of the book of Joshua that, with the exception of a few passages earlier, we know was written by Joshua. We do, however, have five verses that act as a postscript to this book that could not have been written by Joshua, but were added some time later. We'll discuss those verses, the Lord willing, in the next lesson. With that, our time is up for today. The Lord willing, we hope you'll join us for tomorrow's discussion of Joshua chapter 24, verses 29 to 33, as we continue our walk through the Bible, one verse at a time. I'm not a Thank you for watching today's episode. We hope that you found it edifying and ask that you not only subscribe to our channel and podcast, but that you like and share this episode among your friends so that the saving gospel of Jesus Christ can go out to the whole world. Amen.